All right, so we're just going to wait a few minutes yeah. for everyone to get a chance to log on. Okay, I think we can start. Okay. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our White Fund webinar. First time that we do this as a webinar. Um, building the City of Lawrence, the 175th anniversary of the arrival of the first Irish immigrants. Today, you're going to be hearing from Richard Padova. Uh, Rich Padova teaches in the Global Studies Department, the Department of Academic Preparation, and the Center for Adult Education at Northern Essex Community College. During the summer, he is a historical tour interpreter at Lawrence Heritage State Park, where he, prov where he provides museum tours of the visitor center, walking tours of the historic Mill District, and narrated boat tours of the Merrimack River. Richard has also written three books, First in the Nation, One Insider's View of the New Hampshire Presidential Primary, Who Are They?, A Look at Vice Presidential Spouses from Abigail Adams to Karen Pence, and do out this fall, concession speech, portraits of America's unsuccessful presidential candidates. Richard is also a member of the Alumni Advisory Board at Northern Essex, at Northern Essex, Andover Center for History and Culture, Lawrence History Center, Friends of Lawrence Heritage State Park, Parish Pastoral Council of St. Augustine Church in Andover, and the St. Alfio Society in Lawrence. Um, there will be a Q&A session after the lecture. You may enter your questions in the Q&A board um, at the little bottom of your Zoom screen. There should be a Q&A, um, and the questions will be answered after the lecture. Thank you. Take it away, okay. Rich. Yes, good afternoon, Anna Luz, and uh, thank you for the introduction. And for uh, those of you who are uh, viewing the presentation right now, thank you for uh, tuning in this afternoon. Uh, I appreciate your attendance here and uh, participation. Uh, so what I will do uh, for about an hour or a little under is uh, talk about <clears throat> the, uh, the Irish uh, immigrants uh, in, uh, in Lawrence. Uh, this year, 2020, is uh, a milestone uh, anniversary year. Uh, for, for Irish immigration in Lawrence. Uh, this year marks the 175th uh, anniversary uh, of the arrival of the first of the uh, Irish immigrants in, uh, in Lawrence. And uh, I thought this would be uh, a, good, a good topic for uh, a white fun presentation. So, um, and uh, I tied in with the uh, milestone 175th fifth anniversary this year uh, of the arrival of the first of the Irish immigrants in Lawrence are uh, two other important uh, events. Uh, first of all, uh, in 1845, so again 175 years ago, uh, the Essex Company, the, the group of uh, founders, uh, the investors, uh, the group of investors who founded the city of Lawrence, uh, 175 years ago, uh, they, uh, they received uh, their charter. So that's uh, an important uh, event uh, in the early development of Lawrence as well. And also, uh, 175 years ago this year, uh, the building of the Great Stone Dam uh, had begun. So uh, the, uh, the cornerstone, or the first stone, uh, was laid uh, actually on my birthday, September 19th, uh, 1845, not my birth year, but my birthday is September 19th. And uh, it was completed exactly uh, three months, uh, I'm sorry, three years uh, later to the day, September 19th, 1848. So uh, those three events, the, uh, the arrival of the first Irish immigrants, the Essex Company receiving their charter, and the building, uh, the laying of the cornerstone, the first stone of the Great Stone Dam, uh, all happened uh, 175 years ago. So um, 
So again, lots of uh, history there, uh, uh, 175 years ago in the making, uh, and in particular in the making of the city of Lawrence uh, into the great uh, textile center that, uh, that it became. <clears throat> so um, so uh, this afternoon, uh, <clears throat> what I'll do is I will um, review, uh, first of all, we're going to back up a little and talk about what brought the Irish uh, to Lawrence. Uh, namely the uh, the great potato famine uh, in uh, in Ireland. So uh, we'll start off with some background information uh, about the great potato famine, uh, since that was the uh, event that brought most of the Irish immigrants to Lawrence initially. And then we'll talk about what uh, greeted them uh, here when they got to Lawrence and how they um, how they began their new life here in Lawrence and some of the things, uh, some of the events, uh, some of the um, uh, occurrences uh, that happened uh, as they, uh, as time went on and they got established uh, in, in the city of Lawrence. So to begin with, um, we're going to talk about uh, this right now, if everybody can see this, okay? Uh, this, of course, is a potato, all right? And again, this is uh, inextricably uh, tied in uh, to the development of the city of Lawrence because it's uh, this potato, right, okay, that again brought most or all of the early Irish immigrants to Lawrence and uh, enabled it uh, through their hard work and other things to become uh, what it became, this great uh, textile manufacturing center on the banks of the Merrimack River. So first of all, <clears throat> um, again, we'll start at the beginning and uh, a little potato history, uh, if you will. So um, now, uh, potatoes <clears throat> are not uh, native uh, to Ireland, actually, okay? But uh, likely uh, they originated in the Andes Mountains of uh, Peru, actually, uh, in South America. Uh, and uh, they were known as patata, uh, P-A-T-A-T-A. -A -A. You can sort of see where we're going with this, right? Patata then became a uh, potato. But uh, when they originated in the Andes, they were known as patata. So uh, what happened was Spanish conquerors uh, took them back to Europe, uh, and they eventually reached England, uh, where at that point they became known as what we know them as today, uh, potatoes, all right? So around 1600 or so, <clears throat> um, the uh, potatoes were introduced uh, to Ireland, and uh, farmers quickly discovered uh, that they that they thrived uh, in their country's uh, cool, moist soil uh, with little labor. Okay, they required actually uh, little maintenance. Okay, so everything was perfect: the climate, the soil, very little labor required. Perfect for growing uh, potatoes. So by <clears throat> by the 1800s, uh, the potato uh, became the um, the staple uh, crop. Uh, in the poorest regions of uh, Ireland. Uh, the potato crop and the ensuing devastation occurred mostly on the western side of Ireland and southwestern corner of Ireland. So uh, three million Irish peasants uh, subsisted solely on potatoes, okay? Uh, you know, to, to some people, maybe that wouldn't sound too appetizing, all right? But they had to make do uh, with you know what they were able to grow back then, and uh, the uh, the potato, all right, this this thing here is actually uh, very rich in vitamins and minerals. Okay, uh, considered bland perhaps by some people, but uh, again, rich in vitamins and minerals. So the poor Irish peasant farmers uh, benefited uh, from that with the potatoes. So uh, <clears throat> and a single acre, one acre of uh, fertilized potatoes uh, could yield up to 12 tons of potatoes. That's a lot of potatoes, right? Okay, uh, enough to feed a family of six for one year and with leftovers actually, right? Which normally would go to the farm animals that belong to the, uh, to the Irish family. So <clears throat> the bottom line, uh, people were sustained 
uh, as long as the potato crop didn't fail, all right? So it was good while it was going well, okay? Uh, when things did not go well, then the potato system, if you will, crop system, then that's when it failed, okay? But under normal conditions, no blight, no fungus, uh, the potato crop uh, did uh, well, it did not fail, all right? So now, um, so by the summer of um, 1845, uh, the blight now uh, began, uh, and it, it devastated Ireland's potato crop, uh, which again was the basic staple in the Irish uh, diet. Okay, diet meaning uh, the food that people consume in order to stay alive. Okay, so uh, now it's interesting. Uh, they weren't sure uh, initially what caused uh, the blight. Okay, uh, some people thought that it was the result of uh, smoke from locomotives. Okay, so trains going by. Uh, traveling nearby on the train tracks. Some people thought that uh, the smoke from the locomotive engines caused uh, the potato blight, all right? Uh, others thought that uh, it was caused by rising vapors from underground volcanoes, actually, uh, that that's what caused uh, the blight, okay? But uh, in fact, uh, the cause uh, was a fungus, uh, that had traveled uh, to Ireland uh, from North America, and specifically probably Mexico. So that was the actual cause, not smoke from trains or underground volcanoes. So uh, cholera, uh, dysentery, scurvy, <coughs> uh, typhus, and infestations of lice uh, soon spread uh, through the Irish countryside, all right? So things multiplied quickly uh, once the fungus was uh, established. And over the next 10 years, so 1845 to 1855, uh, more than 750,000 <clears throat> Irish uh, died and another 2 million uh, left their homeland uh, for uh, Great Britain, Canada, uh, and the United States. So uh, now it's important to point out that uh, famine wasn't uh, simply a natural disaster. Uh, it was also a product of social causes, all right? So for example, uh, under British rule, uh, Irish Catholics were prohibited uh, from entering the professions uh, or even purchasing land, all right? So instead, uh, what the Irish did, uh, or because of that, is they rented uh, small plots of land. Uh, they were known basically as tenant farmers. Uh, so they rented these small plots of land from uh, absentee uh, British Protestant landlords. Okay, So over half of the uh, land holdings uh, were less than five acres in 1845. All right, so again, small plots of land, uh, half under five acres. Now, you might ask, okay, well, uh, what about relief efforts, right? What did the government, the British government do? They must have done something uh, in the way of relief efforts, okay? Well, not so fast, right? So basically, the relief efforts were inadequate, uh, which actually worsened the horrors uh, of the uh, famine. So, uh, and you know, initially, uh, England believed that the, the free market uh, would, would end the famine. They took this laissez-faire approach, you know, hands off, uh, things will straighten out by themselves, you know, the market, uh, the free market will take care of everything, all right? Uh, but again, it uh, didn't work out uh, too well. And uh, also, uh, believe it or not, the government went so far uh, as to blame the tenant farmers, okay, saying that, oh, they're practicing poor farming techniques. It's their own fault. Uh, they had what they got coming to them, okay? Uh, but, uh, but again, anything but, you know, to face uh, reality, to face the truth of what was happening. So basically, you know, begrudgingly, uh, the government uh, did hand off uh, relief efforts to local 
uh, Irish landowners. They didn't want to really touch it, right? So they pawned it off to the local Irish landowners. You'll deal with this. It's on, you know, after all, it's on the land that you own. Uh, and also they pawned it off to the British uh, absentee uh, landlords or landowners uh, as well. Now, uh, by the spring of 1847, and remember the famine began 1845, so by the spring of 1847, um, the relief efforts of the British government, what they actually did end up doing, uh, such as public works projects, workhouses, uh, soup kitchens, uh, just weren't intended uh, to deal uh, with a crisis of such a sweeping scope, okay? So it was just too, whatever you want to call it, too little, too late, uh, a bad uh, hands-off approach, okay? Uh, didn't want to face up to it, didn't want the responsibility. And, you know, where does that leave the poor Irish tenant farmer? Well, uh, basically nowhere, all right? So at the end of the day, uh, the peasantry, those tenant farmers, uh, couldn't pay their rent, okay? Without, without their potato crop, uh, they, uh, they didn't have the money to pay their rent, right? So uh, the landlords, therefore, did not have the funds to try, at least to try to make an effort to support them. Uh, what was the result? Well, evictions, okay? So a lot of these Irish peasantry, the small, uh, uh, the, uh, small farmers, uh, were evicted uh, from the land that, that they were farming. And, and here's a troubling fact. Uh, these in, uh, impoverished uh, Irish peasantry, uh, lacking the money now uh, to purchase the foods that their farms produced, okay, the farms that were not affected by the potato blight that were actually growing other crops, okay. Uh, so the, the peasantry lacking uh, the money to purchase the foods that some of these Irish farms uh, elsewhere were producing uh, continued uh, throughout the, the famine uh, to, uh, to export grain, uh, meat, and, uh, and other foods uh, to Britain, okay, uh, where they were held in, in uh, storehouses uh, for speculation on the commodities market. So, uh, so there was the potato famine, okay, but at the same time, uh, there was, uh, you know, this grain, this meat, other food products that were growing uh, fine in Ireland uh, being um, sent out, all right, to, uh, to Britain. Uh, and again, as you might imagine, a, a pure matter of uh, economics, okay, uh, to hold in speculation uh, for the commodities markets. So uh, that, that did not obviously help the, uh, Again, all going, no, going back to the poor peasant farms, that did not help them at all. So the, the government's uh, grudging and ineffective measures only served to intensify uh, the resentment of uh, British rule uh, among the, um, the uh, Irish people, okay? So basically, it made a bad situation uh, worse. So altogether, about one million people uh, in Ireland are estimated to have died uh, of starvation and uh, epidemic disease between 1846 and uh, 1851. And some 2 million emigrated, uh, again, mostly to Great Britain, uh, Canada, or the United States uh, between 1845 and 1855. And, uh, you know, prior to the, um, the uh, Great Potato Famine, um, about uh, or 60, about 60 percent uh, of the nation's food uh, needs were uh, were uh, provided for by the potato crop. Okay, so again, just to show you, right, the importance of this little thing here, all right, to uh, to uh, survival. Okay, uh, to basic food needs uh, in in uh, in Ireland for nourishment. So, and. Um, before I wrap up the introduction here uh, with the background information on the famine, um, post-famine, okay, what happened post-famine? Well, uh, more of the land uh, was eventually uh, used for grazing uh, sheep and cattle now rather than growing potatoes, all right? So uh, more land was being used to graze uh, sheep and cattle, uh, providing uh, animal uh, foods for export uh, to Britain. 
And in the following uh, decades after the famine uh, had subsided, uh, Ireland's population actually continued to decline uh, because of overseas emigration and lower uh, birth rates. And by the time the uh, Irish, or by the time Ireland had achieved independence in 1921, uh, its population was barely half of what it had been uh, in the early 1840s, okay? Roughly going from 8 million to roughly 4 million. So almost chopped in half pre and post uh, uh, famine. So, okay, now, and actually, I uh, let me bring up my PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, let me back up a little. Sorry about that. I was so excited about getting started. Uh, so uh, here's the uh, the introduction, the cover page to today's uh, PowerPoint uh, slide presentation, and. Uh, a map of Ireland and Northern Ireland, which Northern Ireland being part of the UK, uh, just to put things into perspective for you. Um, so uh, you can see Ireland, again, it was mostly Western Ireland and uh, Southwestern Ireland, where you see Kerry there, County Kerry. Uh, uh, Rich, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, Rich. We can't, yes. see, the, you, we can't see the PowerPoint. You have to um, uh, present okay. your, your screen. Oh, okay, let me, all right, let me share the screen, sorry. Okay, so let's do this. And, okay, how's that? Yep, we got okay, it. Okay, good, okay, good. So let me back up. Okay, so there's the uh, cover page for today's PowerPoint. Uh, slide presentation, okay. Um, map of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, personal recommendation, a great place to visit. My wife and I have been to uh, Ireland uh, twice. Uh, once, uh, well, the first time to the uh, southwest there, County Kerry. Uh, the second time to uh, Dublin. And then uh, five years ago for our 25th uh, wedding anniversary, we went to Belfast in uh, Northern Ireland. So beautiful countries, uh, great places to visit. Obviously, probably not a good idea right now because of the pandemic, but uh, under normal uh, circumstances, you know, uh, very uh, interesting places to visit. Um, so we're going to do a little show and tell now. And, uh, you know, again, this is all tied into the Irish and the, uh, and, uh, the Irish being the first uh, uh, immigrants, ethnic, uh, uh, immigrants uh, to uh, arrive in Lawrence. Now, one of the things that Ireland, and again, from my personal uh, visit, uh, one of the things, of course, Ireland is known for uh, is the Blarney Stone, right? Okay, so here's a picture of uh, Blarney Castle, uh, which is located in the town of Blarney, okay? And of course, you know, when one goes to Ireland, one uh, perhaps uh, would feel obligated uh, to uh, do the, uh, the obligatory, you know, kissing of the Blarney Stone, right? Okay, you know, how can you go to Ireland without kissing the Blarney Stone, right? Okay, but not so easy. Uh, just briefly, uh, when you arrive at the castle that you see in the picture here, okay, uh, you have to climb uh, steps or stairs all the way to the rooftop, okay? Uh, sorry, there's no elevator, all right, but uh, the castle is pretty much. Uh, um, hollowed out inside, okay, but there's uh, uh, a stairwell there, uh, and rock, or, you know, or brick, I think rock steps made out of rocks, uh, that you have to climb and go all the way to the top of the roof, okay. Now, the Blarney Stone is embedded, uh, where you see that arrow there, okay, that uh, sort of arch-looking uh, thing on top of the roof line there, okay. So, if you want to kiss the Blarney Stone, uh, what you need to do is you have to get flat on your back, okay, and this old curmudgeon -y guy <laughs> uh, slides you, I think it's his retirement job, uh, he slides you into place, okay, so you're like under the Blarney Stone there, under that sort of thing that looks like an arch, okay, and 
when you first take a look at it, at what you're supposed to kiss, uh, to be frank, it's disgusting looking. There's all kinds of lipstick, uh, lipstick <laughs> and other junk on the stone there that you're supposed to be kissing. So my wife and I, Lori and I, uh, when we were both uh, on our backs and uh, yanked into place there, uh, what we did is we just blew a kiss in the direction of the stone. We didn't uh, dare put our lips on it, okay? Uh, but what I did though <clears throat> is um, I brought back uh, a piece of a uh, piece of stone as a little keepsake uh, from the Blarney Castle. All right, so you know, uh, fair warning here. Uh, in the news, you know, if you ever hear of the castle collapsing or something, well. You can blame me. It's because I took this rock out of the castle, you know, and <laughs> and that might be the reason for the collapse. Anyway, um, so um, that is Blarney Castle, and uh, a uh, very interesting uh, uh, experience uh, to say the least. Okay. Uh, oh, then so then after you're done kissing or make believe kissing. Uh, the Blarney Stone, then the old curmudgeon guy grabs you by your feet and then slides you back out uh, from under the arch there. And then, you know, you get up and then walk back down the stairs and out onto the castle grounds. So, uh, fair warning there. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, from my visit there five years ago to Belfast, Lori and I, uh, as you, as my audience or some in my audience may know, uh, Belfast was um, at the Harland and Wolf shipyard, which you can tour today, uh, is where the Titanic, the famous Titanic, uh, was built. And uh, there's a lot, you can do a lot of walking around there. You could see the slip uh, where it was, the dry dock where it was, the pump house uh, that provided the water. Uh, into the dry dock in order to float the Titanic and get it out to the open sea, the Irish Sea. And there's a museum there too, I believe it's called the Titanic Experience, a wonderful 21st century uh, museum. And uh, you'll learn everything you ever wanted to know about the, uh, the Titanic. And, um, and let me just grab something else here. <clears throat> so, uh, now, a couple of uh, mementos I brought back from uh, Belfast, from the shipyard where the uh, Titanic was built. Um, when, uh, when it was in dry dock, um, it was resting on wooden blocks, okay? Uh, and you could go down, I think it's supposed to be like 40, 44 feet down. You climb down steps and you could stand right there where the Titanic was resting. Uh, on these wooden blocks uh, when it was in dry dock, okay, before it began sailing uh, the seas. Uh, although, as we know, uh, a very uh, ill-fated uh, maiden voyage. So uh, this is a, uh, a sliver, a pretty good sized sliver from one of the uh, blocks where the keel of the uh, Titanic was resting uh, when it was in dry dock. So uh, heads up, uh, Probably by tomorrow morning on eBay, I'll have this listed. Probably an opening bid of like, I don't know, $25 maybe, and we'll see where it goes from there. Only kidding, ha ha ha. But anyway, just thought I'd share this with you. And, uh, and here is a, a couple of pieces of uh, stone uh, from the, the dry dock uh, where the Titanic was resting uh, prior to beginning its uh, voyage. Uh, we'll start the opening bid at ten dollars on these on eBay. Again, haha, uh -huh, only kidding. <laughs> okay, so uh, now uh, let's get back to uh, potatoes, if you will. Okay, so uh, now um, a little more um, <clears throat> a little more information here, and then we'll uh, we'll move uh, to uh, Lawrence to talking about Lawrence. Uh, so. This is what uh, a blighted uh, potato uh, would have looked like, okay, during the Great uh, Potato Famine. So uh, not too appetizing, right? Okay, I don't think anybody would want to uh, have one of those. So uh, again, you know, imagine that, okay, uh, multiplied, you know, by millions, all right? And that's what the Irish were confronting, okay? So basically, without the potato, 
for, uh, again, a good deal of the Irish population, there was no nourishment or sustenance, okay? So they were sunk <clears throat> uh, without, the, uh, without a uh, bountiful or fruitful uh, potato crop, all right? But what you see there, that's pretty much what the Irish potato fields uh, had, uh, had uh, looked like uh, in, in uh, Ireland, all right? So, all right, so what was the consequence of all this or the result of, of uh, being uh, confronted by this blight now, all these poor peasant farmers? Well, um, you basically had two choices in the mid 1840s if you were a poor uh, peasant uh, tenant farmer in Ireland, uh, you could either stay there uh, in Ireland, take your chances with starvation and quite possibly death, okay, or come to America, all right, the land of opportunity, and uh, see if maybe you can make a go of it uh, in, uh, in America, okay, North America, uh, America. So, uh, and you know, I, I forgot to mention early, but again, just to, I forgot to mention earlier, but uh, just to mention, and I'm not trying to be gruesome here, but uh, just to paint the picture for you, uh, if you will. Uh, so uh, a lot of the, uh, the poor peasant Irish farmers and, uh, and, and the Irish population in general, uh, because of the great uh, potato uh, famine, uh, they were just basically wandering around uh, in search of food uh, with whatever little strength they might have had left. So uh, a lot of them resorted to um, walking on roadsides or walking on roads or, you know, staying on the roadside and begging for food uh, from passersby, people passing by, you know, uh, or, uh, and, and as well, uh, uh, as they were wandering around, like the countryside, uh, resorting to, uh, in, in their final days especially, uh, to eating weeds. Uh, and I know it doesn't sound uh, appetizing at all, but again, you know, it was a matter of survival. And when, uh, when a lot of these um, Irish were found after dead, like along the roadways and in, in, the, uh, in the countryside, uh, their lips were all green. And that was from uh, trying to eat weeds uh, as a last resort during their final days uh, in order to survive. So with that in mind, uh, what's again, the alternative? Well, let's come to America and uh, see uh, if we can perhaps start over in America. So what you see on the screen is uh, what was known then as a coffin ship, okay? Uh, as you might imagine, um, the, uh, the ships uh, were not uh, most people's idea of a good voyage across the Atlantic, okay? Uh, a lot of people got sick on these ships. Uh, some of them, by the time they got to America, they were dead already. They were crammed into these ships, very unsanitary, very unhealthy. Uh, it could have taken one, even two months uh, to get across the Atlantic uh, to uh, America. And uh, these people were being taken advantage of. They were being exploited by those who were running these ships to America, uh, clearly uh, taking advantage of uh, people who were desperate and, and trying to come to, uh, to a new land. So that was an issue there. Okay, now, all right, so all roads from Boston and Canada lead to Lawrence. All right, so a lot of the Irish, once they did get to America, landed either in Boston or uh, Canada. And um, they uh, had heard about uh, this uh, new city, and actually, and I'll get to this in a little while, one of the early names for Lawrence was New City, uh, taking shape. Uh, this great industrial center, uh, hence jobs, okay, uh, for the offing. So uh, a lot of them came uh, to Lawrence from either Boston or Canada uh, for the employment, uh, which again would enable them to start over. And those who came to Boston, uh, a lot of them would, uh, if they could afford, well, if they could afford it, they would take the train 
up to Lawrence or a wagon. Uh, many, however, uh, could not afford transportation from Boston to Lawrence, so they actually walked, if you can believe it, walked from Boston uh, to what was to become the city of Lawrence, uh, again, just for that opportunity uh, to, uh, to start over. And by the way, um, you may know Lawrence uh, has a nickname. We're not, we're not sure when it began, but uh, or who coined it, but for a long time, <coughs> Lawrence has been known as the immigrant city, right? And it all began with the Irish here, uh, followed by uh, a cavalcade of, uh, of others, plenty. Uh, at, the, at the peak of the, uh, the mills in Lawrence, uh, around the turn of the century, they, uh, there were as many as 45 different languages being spoken in the mills. So, um, so it was quite, uh, quite the uh, United Nations, if you will, uh, in, in the textile mills of Lawrence. Okay, so uh, the early development of, um, of Lawrence. Okay, so um, just um, a little history lesson here. Um, this is not a picture of Lawrence, okay? Uh, obviously with the mountains in the background, that wouldn't be Lawrence, but uh, to give you an idea of what Lawrence would have looked like prior to its industrial development and the arrival of the Irish, uh, followed by other ethnic immigrant groups, uh, and again, all of this beginning uh, in the mid 1840s. So uh, Lawrence was um, um, really undeveloped, uh, again, just prior to industrial development in the mid 1840s. Uh, there was a lot of open land. Um, a, uh, it also contained farmland, uh, sand dunes, uh, some swamps, some forest land. And there were only about 100 people living in what was to become the city of Lawrence. And uh, the Essex Company, uh, again, the group of wealthy investors uh, who developed uh, the city of Lawrence, uh, they uh, petitioned uh, the general court, uh, in other words, the Massachusetts State Legislature, uh, for land uh, to, uh, to create or help create uh, the city of Lawrence. So um, by legislative decree, uh, what happened uh, was um, about three and a half square miles of land north of the Merrimack River and Methuen were taken, and about three and a half or so square miles of land south of the Merrimack and over uh, were taken from those two towns, uh, put together to form the city of Lawrence, okay? And that's why the Merrimack River uh, cuts right through uh, the center of Lawrence. Okay, so Lawrence, and I'm, I'm sure some in my some in my audience today probably know this already, but uh, Lawrence was carved out of Methuen and uh, and Andover. So, um, um, so Lawrence, uh, once the Irish got here, once they arrived here, uh, the population just like zoomed uh, from from there, from around from only around a hundred people. Uh, just prior to industrial development in 1845, by 1851 or so, the population had zoomed up, had already zoomed up to uh, around 6,000 people. And then just kept going up and up and up and up from there with the arrival of many other ethnic immigrant groups. So um, the population in Lawrence um, never hit 100,000, uh, but, um, a little at its peak, um, like the very late eight, um, 1800s, the 1890s, right around the turn of the century, uh, it peaked at a little under 90,000, probably like 86, 87,000. So, um, but again, um, before industrial development, Lawrence was, if you can believe it, basically no man's land. Uh, and uh, today, of course, it has, um, it's uh, highly developed and uh, has one of the highest density rates in the country. You have about 80,000 people or so on uh, a little under seven square miles of land. So um, it, you know, the population density in Lawrence is quite high today. So, uh, and actually, I think I skipped a slide. Let me, uh, yes, okay. So now, <clears throat> uh, when the Irish arrived here, okay, uh, what did they do, okay? Well, uh, 
Uh, first of all, they needed a new, they, they needed a roof over their heads, right? The, the two things they had to do when they got here was try to secure housing <coughs> and uh, get a job, right? Okay, and the two pretty much had to happen uh, simultaneously, okay? So now this is not Lawrence, but this is a picture uh, of a shanty uh, in, in uh, Latin America. They're known as barrios. Uh, uh, other parts of the world, uh, shanties, they have other names as well, but basically what you see here is what, uh, is what they would be, okay? So, uh, and uh, the translation uh, from Gaelic, okay, uh, the word shanty translated from Gaelic, uh, it means old house, all right? So you can get an idea why uh, the term shanty came about, old house, all right? So, now, uh, these uh, shanties that the Irish would, uh, uh, would live in, uh, many of them, especially early on, would live in, uh, were located south of the dam, okay, the, uh, the Great Stone Dam. Uh, oh, and by the way, you know, speaking of the Great Stone Dam, I just happen to have something else here to show you. <clears throat> okay, so here we have a piece of granite uh, from the Great Stone Dam. Okay, so you know if if any of uh, if anyone in my audience was driving by Broadway yesterday, uh, Route 28 yesterday afternoon, and you know you saw somebody in a little boat uh, on the top of the dam with a hammer and chisel, that was probably me. <laughs> no, only kidding. But this is a uh, a piece of uh, granite uh, from the top of the Great Stone Dam uh, in Lawrence. Uh, check eBay tomorrow. We'll start the bidding. I mean, this I really have to start it like at a hundred dollars. All right, only kidding. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and the uh, the, uh, the the dam, uh, the granite that was used uh, to build the Great Stone Dam, by the way, uh, it, it came. Uh, most of that granite came from quarries, uh, either uh, from uh, Pelham, New Hampshire or uh, Rockport, Massachusetts, and it was brought to Lawrence by horse and wagon, and then uh, put into place by uh, the Irish laborers, okay? And it was mostly, um, some of the native population here had helped with the building of the dam, but built mostly uh, by the Irish. Uh, and again, you know, they, uh, they needed a job, uh, when they got here, okay. Um, now again, you know, they were mostly farmers, okay. Uh, but they learned quickly, and uh, they were hired uh, to uh, to uh, work on the dam, and uh, and they did a good job considering construction really wasn't their background. Uh, but they did a good job because all these years now since the dam opened uh, in 1848 and when it was completed in 1848, it has never needed any major type of construction work uh, done to it, okay? So uh, the Irish did uh, an excellent job uh, building uh, the, the, the dam, which of course was built in order to create that power, uh, harness the power of the Merrimack River uh, in order to power the, uh, the turbines uh, in the mills in order to uh, power the looms that made the textiles, okay? So uh, the Irish immigrants besides uh, uh, getting jobs building the dam. They also got jobs building the mills uh, and uh, hand digging the uh, the canals, uh, beginning with the the North Canal that runs along Canal Street, uh, in order to get the water from the mill pond at the dam uh, into the mills to power the turbines. Okay, but anyway, getting back to the shanties. Uh, so uh, the Irish now uh, wanted to live uh, really close. To where they were working, okay. So either the the dam or the mills that were nearby that were being built at the same time. So they uh, they built their uh, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> they built um, their shanties uh, south of the dam. Uh, if uh, if, if those are my audience, if you know where South Broadway is, if you're heading into South Lawrence, uh, going down South Broadway, uh, St. Patrick's Church is on your left. And then Kingston Street is on your right. So at South Broadway and Kingston Street, that was the main area where the shanties uh, were located. All right. So again, just a very short walk uh, for the Irish immigrants from their home uh, in the shanties to uh, the dam where it was being uh, built. 
And uh, the other big uh, shanty uh, neighborhood was uh, north of Havel Street, immediately north of Havel Street, uh, known as the Plains uh, neighborhood of Lawrence. So um, where the Lawrence Public Library is right now, the old Lawrence High School, Breen's Funeral Home, if you can picture that area north of Havel Street, St. Anthony's Maronite Church, uh, that was the other big uh, shanty town uh, in the early uh, history of Lawrence, okay, when, uh, when the Irish began arriving here. So uh, <clears throat> now, although these shanties were intended as temporary housing, uh, a lot of them ended up uh, being used for decades, all right? Um, and uh, let me, uh, if any of uh, those of you in my audience, if you saw the article, uh, about today's presentation in this past Friday's Eagle Tribune, uh, there was a picture there of this shanty. Uh, thank you to Lawrence Heritage State Park, by the way, for this, uh, where I give my tours in the summertime. So uh, this is uh, a picture of one of the shanties that was in South Lawrence uh, off South Broadway, okay? So, and uh, the last one in Lawrence was uh, demolished in 1894. So they were up uh, from the 1840s up until the last one came down uh, in 1894 in South Lawrence. So, um, so no two look alike, uh, no two looked alike. Uh, they could have been as small as seven feet by 10 feet uh, and up to 120 feet long. And uh, some of them housed up to 100 people, all right? Each individual shanty, uh, again, different sizes, you know, but uh, one single one, uh, if it was one of the 120 uh, foot long ones, let's say, for example, could have housed up to 100 uh, people. And uh, those uh, who built them, uh, the shanties, uh, cited them on land uh, that they uh, rented from either the Essex Company or from one of the mills uh, that, uh, from one of the, uh, the mill owners there who was building uh, his mills uh, for about $2 a month, okay? So uh, they were rented about $2 a month uh, for those who built them. Uh, the land that they were built on, excuse me, was rented for about $2 a month. And uh, they charged boarders. So the ones who built them, they were renting them from the Essex company. Uh, they charged uh, boarders uh, half, <laughs> half a penny a day uh, in order to shelter there, all right? Um, as you can imagine, uh, they were built of uh, wood scraps, uh, tin, uh, sod, uh, other discarded construction materials. Uh, they were, and you know, as you might imagine, they were cold, damp, uh, drafty. But again, what's the alternative, right? Starving an island and possible death, all right? so. Um, and they, they were heated with uh, primitive stoves, and uh, the floors uh, usually consisted of dirt or packed sawdust, all right? So, as you might imagine, they were very fire-prone. So fires were very common uh, in these uh, shanties, okay? So by 1847, and again, you know, the Irish had begun arriving in Lawrence in 1845, uh, by 1847, uh, it was estimated. Um, uh, it was estimated that there were hundreds. Uh, it's hard to put an exact number on it, but hundreds uh, of these shanties uh, in Lawrence, uh, South Lawrence, the south side of the river, uh, on and to the north of Havel Street on the north side of the river. So, uh, and you know, I just want to mention that not all uh, living conditions for the Irish were grim. Uh, some, for example, some single Irish women uh, who worked in the mills uh, lived in company boarding houses, uh, which were fairly well kept, you know, with uh, strict rules. And uh, as early as the 1860s, when uh, the Civil War began, uh, some of the more established Irish uh, immigrants uh, began to buy single family cottages or homes on Prospect Hill or uh, Tower Hill, all right? So, uh, and just to wrap it up about shanties before we uh, continue on, uh, just so you know, uh, the 
um, the, the shanty settlements in Lawrence, in particular the one in South Lawrence, south of the dam, uh, it was known as different names, not surprisingly. Uh, for example, Dublin, uh, also uh, the Shanty District, Shanty Pond, uh, Shanty Pond District, or uh, Shanty Town South Side. <laughs> okay, so those were the different names, nicknames, whatever you want to call them, that were given to the shanty settlements uh, in South Lawrence. Okay. And uh, I just want to mention um, that within the shanty pond development, if you will, uh, a second uh, residential development uh, came about and was known as the patch, okay? So the shanty settlement in South Lawrence spawned an additional uh, settlement there known as the patch. And uh, they were often interchangeably used during the second half of the, uh, the, the terms uh, were interchangeably used, Shanty Pond and the Patch uh, during the uh, mid to late 1800s. <clears throat> but um, in the early 1900s, uh, some residents identified the Patch uh, as a district, a distinct part of, uh, of Shanty Pond, okay? And the, the residents of the Patch uh, actually saw themselves as one step above uh, the Irish who were still living in the older parts of Shantytown in South Lawrence. Uh, so now, so you went from, let's say, the Shantytown, the first one that, that had begun in South Lawrence, okay, then let's say above that was the patch, okay, and then the, uh, the next step up the social ladder for the Irish uh, in Lawrence was known as the uh, the lace the lace curtain district, okay, which was east of Union Street. Uh, so basically, let's say <clears throat> where um, oh, you know, like where the uh, uh, the side of Union Street where the Everett Mill would be, or the South Lawrence Common, the O'Connell Common, okay. Uh, so east of Union Street. Uh, that was uh, the uh, the Lace Curtain District, and uh, that was a sure sign. If, if an Irish immigrant uh, eventually made it, uh, let's say, into the Patch, good, all right, uh, into the Lace Curtain District, even better, and that was uh, a sure sign that the American dream uh, was now starting to work, okay, that uh, the Irish uh, had succeeded now by coming to, uh, to Lawrence. So uh, by their hard labor and thrifty ways, uh, the Irish shanties gave way uh, to more modern buildings, more modern dwellings, uh, and their descendants uh, became prominent uh, in the business and professional life of the uh, community. Okay, so uh, just a couple more things here. Uh, now, uh, Catholicism is transported to, uh, to Lawrence. Okay. Um, now, uh, Lawrence, uh, again, was, you know, developed by the Essex Company, a, a group of uh, wasps, okay? So uh, they, uh, Charles Starro and others, uh, designed uh, the uh, uh, complete layout, pretty much, of the city, in particular, and especially the downtown. So uh, it was only Protestant churches uh, that were built in, in the early days of Lawrence, and generally... They were built around the four sides of the common, now known today, of course, as the Campagnon Common, uh, on the National Historic Register, I believe. So, um, but initially, you know, before the arrival of the Irish Catholic immigrants, Lawrence was a Protestant city. Okay, so, uh, so despite the prejudice that the uh, newly arriving Irish Catholic immigrants received from the, the native population, you know, the descendants of the Puritans who had been inhabiting the area uh, for a long time prior to the arrival of the Irish. Uh, the Irish focused on their religion uh, as a defining institution of, of being Irish, okay? That helped get them through, uh, through uh, a lot of things. And they, they celebrated their Catholic uh, faith 
and uh, built the first Catholic churches uh, in Lawrence, and they organized their lives uh, around them, okay? So uh, by the 1880s, uh, we had three grand churches uh, in uh, native brick and granite uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the city of Lawrence, okay? Three Catholic churches, uh, the Immaculate Conception, St. Mary's, and St. Lawrence O'Toole. <clears throat> and um, the Irish had uh, 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 a big sense of pride uh, in their church and its institutions. So for example, the schools that were later built to go with some of these churches, charities, uh, for example, orphanages and uh, hospitals. Okay? So uh, the church, uh, they, they threw themselves, if you will, uh, into the church. And uh, some, um, some research, uh, some of the research that I did for today's presentation, presentation uh, suggested that some of the Irish uh, kept their churches uh, neater than even their own uh, homes, you know, in those early days. So, um, and uh, backing up a little, uh, in the mid 1840s, uh, you know, right before the Irish Catholic immigrants started coming. Uh, there were few Catholics uh, in Lawrence. Uh, the few that were there would, uh, some of them would walk uh, the 10 miles that it took uh, to get to Lowell uh, in order to uh, attend mass uh, in Lowell with Catholics from uh, other surrounding communities. So, and occasionally, if they were lucky, a visiting uh, priest uh, would celebrate mass uh, in one of the shanties. So, uh, either the ones in South Lawrence or the ones in the Plains neighborhood. And uh, <clears throat> the, the first uh, resident priest of Lawrence was a Reverend Charles French, uh, an Irish priest uh, of uh, the Dominican order. And uh, he became the first resident priest in Lawrence uh, in April of 1846. And he established the Immaculate Conception uh, Parish. Uh, that was the first Catholic church uh, in Lawrence to serve the needs of all these newly arriving Irish Catholic immigrants. And it was a small wooden church. Uh, it was located on Chestnut Street, which then would have been in that heavily uh, Catholic uh, Irish neighborhood there where, where they were living in, in the shanties. So um, then in 1855, uh, a larger stone church was built to accommodate the expanding Irish uh, population. And uh, backing up a bit, 1848, uh, Reverend James O'Donnell, uh, OSA, uh, was assigned to assist Reverend French at the Immaculate Conception of Parish in Lawrence. So, um, so in, uh, so St. Mary's Church, okay, uh, the present one at Haverhill and Hampshire Streets, uh, that was dedicated in 1871. Um, and St. Patrick's, uh, long identified uh, as a, uh, an Irish a parish, today it's a mixture. Uh, that St. Patrick's parish uh, for the Irish Catholics in South Lawrence during the early days, uh, that was formed in 1868 and a wooden, a wooden building was dedicated on St. Patrick's Day in 1870 and uh, in honor of the patron saint. And the present brick building on South Broadway uh, was dedicated on June 17th of 1894. So. Okay, um, and I just want to end this now with uh, a look at uh, business and uh, politics. So let me get notes. Okay, so uh, once the uh, Irish got more and more established uh, in Lawrence with their growing numbers, you know, with growing numbers came more clout, more influence, all right? So 1882 was a banner year uh, for the Irish in Lawrence because that is when they, uh, when, well, when the first Irish mayor uh, was elected in the city of Lawrence, John Green of the uh, Green Funeral Home uh, family, okay? 
So uh, he was born in uh, Tripperary, Ireland, and uh, his uh, parents brought him to Lawrence at the age of three and um, educated in the local schools, uh, went to Villanova, uh, became a member of the Lawrence Fire Department, and uh, he was on the Common Council, which pretty much would be the City Council, what we know as the City Council today. So, um, and he was, uh, he held a lot of different offices in Lawrence besides mayor. Uh, again, uh, uh, the Common Council, the City Council, uh, school committee, uh, he did try to run for sheriff, but did not make it uh, there. Uh, but uh, between 1889 and 1910, uh, he was on the school committee. And uh, it was uh, prior to that that he was mayor, 1882, 83, and 84. Back then, they were one-year terms. So, um, so uh, he, um, his... Uh, ancestors now, like four, five generations later, uh, run the Breen Funeral Home uh, in Lawrence in the Old Plains neighborhood, uh, right where those Irish shanties uh, were located uh, once uh, the, uh, the Irish began coming to, uh, to Lawrence. So uh, the Breen Funeral Home continues to be uh, operated by the descendants of, of Mayor uh, Breen. And uh, he was uh, constantly in touch with, you know, the needs of the, uh, of the uh, community. Uh, he uh, helped develop a lot of civic uh, organizations and charities and things like that in Lawrence. Uh, he, uh, in 1869, uh, he established the, the Breen Funeral Home. I believe at first it was on Oak Street, not far from where the present one is located. And uh, so he, uh, that was quite, uh, quite an achievement for the Irish population in Lawrence when uh, one of their own, if you will, was uh, elected mayor. And then after him, there were many other Irish mayors of Irish descent, uh, right up until the 21st century uh, with uh, Mike Sullivan in the, in the early 2000s. So uh, here we have uh, a picture of uh, Mayor Breen, okay. Um, so uh, next, now, um, and I'll wrap it up. Um, so the, the, the Great Potato Famine, okay, which, which brought a lot of Irish to Lawrence, uh, settled Lawrence, they built, developed, helped, uh, helped develop the city of Lawrence, okay, the infrastructure. So how do we remember the, um, you know, the famine, uh, again, the thing, the event, the major event that brought them to Lawrence, well, uh, the An Guatemala Memorial, which is located at the Immaculate Conception Cemetery uh, in Lawrence, okay? And it's, um, it's a way uh, of memorializing the victims of the, of the uh, Great Potato Famine, as well as the history and the contributions uh, of the Irish members of the Greater Lawrence uh, community. So uh, there's a Celtic cross that you can see in the background uh, with the names of Irish <coughs> provinces and counties, uh, along with tablets that honor the, uh, those early Irish priests uh, who uh, were instrumental in, uh, in getting uh, the churches uh, built uh, the Catholic churches uh, in Lawrence. Uh, and the tablets uh, also mention the, um, the early Irish citizens uh, in Lawrence who uh, raised $2,000 for famine relief uh, and the names of the past uh, presidents of the uh, Hibernians, uh, men and women, uh, which is an Irish fraternal organization. So, um, and uh, let's see, okay, uh, my sources, uh, these are the sources that I use to put together this presentation today. Uh, and in particular, uh, Lawrence Heritage State Park, I'd like to thank Jim Beauchene, and at the Lawrence History Center, uh, Amita Kiley and Susan uh, Grap uh, Grapsky. So, uh, and I just wanna back up one second. Uh, I, uh, I had mentioned that Lawrence was called, um, 
the um, the uh, new um, new city. That was one of the names that Lawrence went by. Um, so at first, um, before the name Lawrence came about, um, they weren't quite sure what to call it. Uh, new city, Merrimack, Andover Bridge. But then, uh, 1846, 47, when the uh, post office uh, uh, was built for Lawrence, when they got their, their first post office, uh, then it was decided then, well, they, that's when the post office started using the name Lawrence, because uh, January of 1847 is when there was a meeting that uh, a lot of the residents attended, and it was decided to name this place of Lawrence uh, in honor of Abbott Lawrence and his family. He was the first president of the Essex Company and one of the big investors in the city of Lawrence. So as a token of respect to the Lawrence family, uh, that's when it was decided uh, it would be called Lawrence. And then uh, I believe 1847 onward, that's when the post office began using uh, the name Lawrence, okay? So uh, let me um, get back now. Okay, let's see. All right, now. Are you trying to take off the PowerPoint? Yes. Uh, just at the top, stop sharing screen. Stop uh, share, there we go. Thank you. Okay, thank you, analyst. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. So I guess, uh, would you like to do a Q&A now if anybody has any questions? Yep. We do have some questions. I'll um, okay. start those now. Hold on one second. Hmm. All right. Um, hold on. Let's just open those up. So we actually, so one was more of a comment. Okay. Um, and then uh, one question that we have is, does any evidence of any shanties remain? Uh, any evidence of any uh, shanty remains? Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, that we know of, meaning local historians, uh, there is no evidence left of any shanty remains. Uh, again, the only thing we would have is uh, this photograph of uh, one of the shanties in South Lawrence. And again, the last one uh, was torn down in 1894. And to my knowledge, and other local historians who I often collaborate with, uh, there are no known remains of any of those shanties that are left, which is too bad. It would be nice uh, if we had some kind of an artifact, you know, uh, from, from the shanties. Um, so we have another, another question is, Irish need not apply. Where did that come from? Okay. Uh, yes, um, some in the audience uh, may know about those signs uh, that existed uh, in uh, the 1800s, once the Irish started coming here, uh, even into the early 1900s, Irish need not apply, which would be hung uh, sometimes like in storefronts, okay, if they were hiring, uh, but because uh, the Irish were discriminated against uh, in large part for their Catholic beliefs. Uh, again, this being mostly uh, a WASP, you know, a Protestant nation. Uh, so the Irish uh, did face severe discrimination uh, for their Catholicism and other things, but that was a, a big thing there, the Catholicism. Uh, now in Lawrence, it, again, local historians, okay, uh, as far as we know, we don't really think uh, those signs were used in Lawrence here probably more like in the, in the larger cities like Boston, let's say, uh, but we just don't think offhand those signs were, uh, would have been seen in Lawrence. Uh, but that doesn't mean, of course, they didn't face discrimination here, they did. Uh, just we don't have evidence of those signs being used uh, in Lawrence. Uh, so John Murphy, uh, mentions, my family dates back to my great-great-grandfather. 
Um, and then he also um, had a question. The Irish left Lawrence in large numbers in 1848-1849 due to the completion of the dam. Can you describe that period of Lawrence history? Okay. Um, yeah, after that first wave of Irish immigrants came, uh, <clears throat> that opened up the floodgates to, uh, to many other um, ethnic immigrant groups. Um, now the uh, the Irish, uh, the Irish did uh, still keep coming, uh, and actually uh, they peaked uh, in Lawrence in the uh, the mid eighteen seventies with about eight thousand of them in Lawrence. So and they were the largest group for a while. Okay, uh, but uh, they did keep coming um, even after the dam was completed. Uh, but again, uh, by like the mid 1870s, that's when things started uh, slowing down, peaked and then slowed down. Um, so uh, basically, uh, again, uh, after the Irish came, that opened up the floodgates to other groups um, coming. Uh, and, you know, for, for different reasons, uh, well, mostly the same reasons, but different reasons. Uh, for example, to escape uh, political strife in their country, uh, to escape laws, um, bad politics, uh, revolutions, to escape revolutions. Uh, the French Canadians came down uh, because of poor uh, or hard, hard to farm land up in Canada. So, um, so the, the Irish still did continue to come to Lawrence. Um, but again, after the mid 1870s, that's when it sort of slid down. Um, and, uh, and again, in the meantime, uh, many, many others uh, came uh, after the Irish uh, came or started coming. So for example, the French Canadians, uh, the English, the Germans, and then uh, later on in the 1800s, then it was the, the the Mediterranean region, the Southern Europeans, the Eastern Europeans, now known as Central uh, Europe. Uh, so uh, the Irish, you know, uh, uh, they weren't the dominant group here anymore. Uh, but, uh, but again, they, they, they did keep coming in the ensuing decades after they originally came here. But in the 1870s, that's when we saw like the, the real drop, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Noemi has a question. Um, are there any landmarks for where the shanties used to be? Uh, no. Uh, again, lo local historians, <laughs> uh, as far as we know, uh, there are no kinds of landmarks, which again is a shame uh, where these, uh, where these, uh, yeah, where these historians used to be, where the shanties used to be. Uh, now, uh, there is a landmark, uh, Nothing, well, yeah, nothing to do with the shanties, but just while that topic was brought up, there is like a small marker in uh, South Lawrence off of South Broadway near Andover Street uh, to mark where Daniel Saunders's house once stood. Uh, it was thought, there's some evidence that his house was a stop on the Underground Railroad, which did come through the Lawrence area. But, um, uh, but no, uh, to my knowledge, uh, there are no kinds of markers where these uh, shanties used to exist, which again is a shame. But you know, if, if anybody is walking uh, or driving around South Lawrence uh, when you're on South Broadway and uh, you go by St. Patrick's Church, uh, the neighborhood on the right, like where the Diaz Healy Funeral Home is, uh, Kingston Street, Salem Street, uh, heading towards uh, Riverfront State Park, uh, just, you know, you, you can use your imagination, uh, that whole area there uh, was where the shanties were. And then again, if you're walking or driving along Haverhill Street and you go by the old Lawrence High School, the Lawrence Public Library, St. Anthony's Church, uh, the Breen Funeral Home, again, using your imagination, that's where uh, the other big Irish shanty settlement was located. So. Um, and so we have another question by uh, yeah. Susan Matsula. Is the ethnic composition of mill workers at the time of the Bread and Roses strike in 1912 known? 
had the Lithu Lithuanians and Slavic people already arrived or were the Irish mill workers the main participants? Okay, uh, during the bread and, by the time we, we got to the bread and roses strike or the, or the great textile strike of 1912, we pretty much had everybody in Lawrence, okay? Uh, they were like 45, 40, 45 different languages being spoken uh, in the mills. Uh, and yes, the, the Eastern Europeans uh, were here at that point. Uh, pretty much everybody who was to come here from Europe was here by the time of the great textile strike of 1912. Uh, the, the Latin American uh, immigration to Lawrence uh, did not begin uh, until the uh, 1950s, okay? So when, when the Bread and Roses strike, the great textile strike began, uh, pretty much every, every ethnic group, minus the Latin American population that was to be living and, and or working in Lawrence was here at that point. Uh, so it was a complete, I, I don't have specific numbers, the breakdown for each ethnic group, but uh, a lot of them were, uh, well, they were large numbers of them, let's put it this way. They were, they were large numbers of them represented uh, in, in the textile mills when the strike began, okay? Uh, it's hard to put a, an exact number on each one, they were like 22, 23,000 striking mill workers. And again, every um, immigrant group from Europe uh, had uh, numbers uh, represented there uh, in, in the strike, okay? And, uh, and those of you who've taken my tours uh, at Lawrence Heritage State Park, you, you may know this already, but uh, the strike, was, was begun by uh, Polish female weavers in the Everett Mill on Union Street across from Holy Rosary Church, okay? So it was, uh, it was Polish female weavers when they opened their pay envelopes um, on uh, Thursday, January 11th, 1912, and then the strike began Friday, January 12th, and they called out, you know, uh, workers calling out shot pay, shot pay, shot pay. Uh, they were the ones who were the first to walk out and, and actually begin the strike uh, uh, activities, so. Um, and actually we have another question about the strike. Um, yeah. How did the Irish make out in 1912 Bread and Roses strike? And um, did the Irish and Italians get along during this time? Uh, what was the second part of the question, I'm sorry? Did the Irish and Italians get along during this time? No, nobody got along. Uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to be facetious, but uh, see, uh, with all these different um, ethnic immigrant groups working together side by side in the mills, um, none of them got along, okay? Uh, they, uh, a lot of them couldn't relate to each other's habits and customs and traditions, and then some of them were getting paid more than others, okay? Some immigrant groups, again, all part of the discrimination issue. For example, the Italians were at the bottom of the scale uh, <clears throat> as far as pay. Um, so they, they, they didn't really, none of them really got along in, in the mills, okay? They, they were, you know, working together, but uh, I guess, you know, like the thinking was, well, nobody said we had to be friends, right, you know? And, uh, and again, they just couldn't, a lot of them just couldn't relate to each other's customs and traditions, you know, languages, religion, what have you. Uh, so uh, it wouldn't be just like the Irish and the Italians not um, getting together uh, or getting along, but you can throw in all the other different ethnic immigrant groups and, you know, this one didn't get along with that one, that one didn't get along with this one. So uh, there was very little unity in, in the textile mills, okay? Uh, and again, pay rates varied. Uh, it, it varied by gender. Uh, it, it varied by uh, where you were from and what kind of job you had. For example, if you were a skilled mechanic from England, uh, you were hot stuff, okay? You got preferential treatment, uh, including uh, subsidized housing, 
okay, the mechanic squawk on uh, Garden Street. Uh, during their prime, uh, those were considered uh, like luxury housing for the most part, okay? Uh, so English mechanics, for example, and then if, if they had management skills, wow, there was no end to their, uh, to their uh, popularity, okay, and how much they were sought out and sought after. So, um, and I'm sorry, the first part of the question now, Anna Luz, was what? Hold on one second, let me go back. Okay. Um, yep, it was... Um, yeah, how did the Irish make out in the 1912 bread and roll oh, strike? Okay. Mm -hmm. how, how did the Irish make out in the, in the great textile strike of 1912? Okay, well, um, by the, for, first of all, let me point out, uh, by then, um, their, um, they were no longer the, um, the ethnic group in Lawrence with, uh, with, the, uh, with the highest population, okay? By then, I believe it would have been the Italians and uh, the French, for example, who uh, had more numbers uh, in, in Lawrence than the, uh, than the, uh, uh, than the Irish. So, um, but again, overall, how did the Irish make out during the strike? Well, how did all of the uh, strikers make out during the strike, I guess would be like uh, the broader question, okay? Um, because they all, they all faced the same uh, settlement, if you will, uh, from the strike, okay? So, uh, for example, uh, there was a restoration of wages, uh, the premium system was eliminated, uh, better, safer working conditions were uh, instituted, okay? Uh, and, well, and, and there was supposed to be no blacklisting, but uh, that that was not held up, that part of the bargain. So there was blacklisting uh, for the, uh, you know, the ones who uh, had uh, organizational roles in the strike. So how did they make out? Well, um, after two months, uh, the, mill, uh, the mill owners agreed to the concessions, okay? Uh, some of which I had just mentioned a moment ago. Uh, some of them, they backpedaled on them. Some of them were not implemented immediately. So how did the Irish make out? Well, how did, you know, all of the ethnic groups make out? Well, uh, you know, they, they came together or tried to come together uh, for unity, uh, for power uh, during the strike. Uh, and uh, they were all uh, subject, you know, to the terms of the negotiation. Um, so the Irish and all the other immigrant groups received the settlement uh, package from, from the strike, so. All right, and uh, Ernie has a question. Um, yeah. Did men and women come to Lawrence from Ireland in equal numbers? Uh, did they come to Lawrence did, from did Ireland? Did men and women, yeah, did men and women come to Lawrence from Ireland in equal numbers? Oh, okay. Well, um, I don't have statistics on that, but let me say that um, it would have been like whole families uh, coming most uh, to Lawrence uh, from Ireland. Um, so I don't think, uh, I don't think there was like one, uh, like, oh, a lot more males or, oh, a lot more females. Uh, again, I don't have specific numbers, but I'm, I'm venturing to guess here that the numbers were pretty even. I, I don't think uh, one gender was here in much greater numbers than the other gender of the Irish immigrants. So now the, the Lawrence, uh, Ernie, I believe asked the question, Ernie, uh, if you're interested, uh, probably the Lawrence History Center might be able to shed some light on that if you're interested in the gender breakdown. Uh, again, offhand, I don't have those numbers. Uh, but again, I, I'd be surprised if it was like lopsided, you know, I think it was pretty even, but um, Amita, uh, at the Lawrence History Center might be able to point you in the right direction there. All right, and uh, Pat Willett also has a question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that the shanties were that far out from the city center. Do you know how those areas were decided on? Uh, okay, well, all right, first of all, th those areas were wide open at the time. 
uh, they were not developed. Um, so the land was sitting there and available and, um, and owned by the Essex company or the, the mills. <clears throat> so, um, so there was that land sitting there undeveloped. Uh, it was level uh, for the most part. So uh, a perfect place, you know, uh, to locate the shanties. Uh, now, the, the, the Irish did have to walk uh, to and from work from the shanty, let's say, to the dam that they were working on, and then from the dam uh, back home, okay? So, um, so the, 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 the shanties in South Lawrence were pretty much immediately behind the dam. So uh, if you know like where Shattuck Street is, uh, the Lawrence Experiment Station, uh, Rose Street, uh, Salem Street, uh, by the Diaz Healy Funeral Home, uh, Kingston Street across from St. Patrick's Church, and, and moving in from those areas off of South Broadway. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, and again, they, they did it. They walked. Uh, to me, I don't think it's a great distance to walk, let's say, from Kingston Street to the dam. All right. Uh, maybe the... Um, Maybe the shanties on the north side of the river, north of Haverhill Street. Those, I guess, perhaps would have been a little longer to walk. Um, again, personally, I don't think unwalkable, but maybe a little longer to walk than the shanties in South Lawrence. But, you know, keep in mind, um, and I hate to keep, I don't want to repeat myself, but keep in mind, you know, well, what was the alternative, right? Stay in Ireland. Uh, eat weeds, you know, starve, eat weeds uh, for your final days, and then be found dead on the roadside, you know what I mean? So, again, I guess, and, and um, this is probably what they were thinking as well, not just me, but again, you know, what was the alternative? If I had stayed in Ireland, uh, <laughs> what would have happened to me, you know what I mean? So, so the land was available, it was flat, uh, it was available to rent and to build on, so they, they grabbed it. So. All right. Um, and Eileen Hayes has a question. Uh, do we know anything about the Irish being affected by the great influenza of 1918? Okay. Uh, no, I personally, I don't have specific numbers about that. Um, again, let me just say, uh, like with the great textile strike of 1912, the pandemic, like, well, you know, like today's pandemic would have affected everybody, okay? I mean, let me put it this way, even President Woodrow Wilson at the time got sick from the 1918 pandemic, the, the uh, Spanish flu. So, uh, and you know, during the bubonic plague, uh, just again, for comparison, during the, the Black Death, the bubonic plague, uh, even aristocracy uh, got hit by the bubonic plague, nobody was safe, okay? So like with the 1918 flu, uh, it affected, you know, everybody. Again, I don't have specific numbers, but uh, I'm, again, I'm, I'm venturing to guess that it probably affected every ethnic group. Uh, I don't think it discriminated. Uh, you know, it, it just, it affected everybody to my knowledge, regardless of your ethnic background. Mm -hmm. Um, and Kevin Himber um, wanted to talk uh, a little bit about Pemberton uh, Mill. Uh, what yes. effects did the collapse of the Pemberton Mill yeah. have on the workers? Okay. okay. Uh, some of you in my audience might uh, uh, be familiar with the, um, the collapse of the Pemberton Mill. Uh, that was uh, January 10th, 1860. Uh, <clears throat> um, about five in the afternoon. Uh, they were six to uh, 700 people working in the mill at the time. Uh, a lot of them were Irish uh, immigrants. A lot of them were women. And uh, a lot of them were uh, children uh, as well. So um, I guess you could say they did get hit disproportionately there uh, during the Pemberton mill collapse. Um, so, um, so uh, again, they, they, did make up a, they did make up a good chunk of the workforce at the time. 
Irish immigrants. Out of that six to 700, uh, a good chunk were Irish immigrants, women and children. So you could say they got hit uh, disproportionately there uh, by the disaster. And then uh, just briefly, some of you uh, probably know the story. Um, when the rescuers came in with the lanterns uh, trying to look for survivors, uh, there's conflicting stories as to exactly what happened, but a lantern uh, that was being lowered down into a crevice or a hole to try to look for survivors down there. They were caught in between the machines that had collapsed with the collapse of the floors. Um, so uh, it, it uh, fell over or got knocked over uh, and it, it lit the rubble. Uh, so there was this great conflagration now. So besides the actual uh, collapse of the mill uh, and the damage that that had done, uh, now you had a great fire that enveloped uh, the, uh, the rubble, uh, which made matters even worse. Uh, and again, the, it's hard, um, the, the, the estimates vary a little, but uh, around or a little under 100 people died, surprisingly not more. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, uh, two to 300 thereabouts were, uh, were injured. Uh, and it was known as the Great Lawrence Calamity. Uh, it made, uh, you know, what we would call breaking news today, big news, right? So it made uh, headlines across the country. And when Abraham Lincoln uh, happened to be in Lawrence, uh, March of 1860, uh, he uh, went to Canal Street. This was before uh, the Republican National Convention in June of 1860 nominated him for president. So uh, in March, uh, he happened to be in Lawrence on a train stop uh, visiting his son, Robert, at Phillips Exeter. And uh, he toured the ruins uh, of the Pemberton Mill disaster on Canal Street there. So that's a little story I like to tell during the summer. Well, not this past summer, but hopefully again next summer uh, when I give my tours, my walking tours downtown. Uh, that's a little story. Uh, a little sub story I like to add to the uh, the walking one of my walking tours on Canal Street about Abraham Lincoln visiting Lawrence uh, before he became president, though, and uh, before he was a candidate for president as well. All right. Uh, so John Murphy um, had a comment and a question. Uh, he said, yeah. uh, and a plug too. Uh, Thank you for your, your excellent lecture. I wrote a I wrote a book just published last month on my family's long history in Lawrence, titled "Our Immigrant yeah. Son." And th th I, this is a pretty good question. Uh, what inspires you about Lawrence's past that is relevant today? Um, okay, well, um, the fact that, I, I guess I would say the fact that Lawrence has always been known as the, the immigrant city and it's, it's been here, you know, uh, since, you know, beginning with the Irish right up to the present. Uh, and it has offered immigrants uh, an opportunity uh, to start over here, uh, the American dream, you know, to improve uh, their lives. Uh, you know, and again, whether they were escaping famine or political turmoil, economic turmoil, uh, revolution, uh, Lawrence has always been a place that has welcomed uh, uh, immigrants throughout its history. And I find that very inspiring for today that immigrants still know uh, that they can come to Lawrence and still have a chance here that perhaps they did not have in their homeland. And to me, that's very encouraging. And it, it really puts uh, um, a positive uh, 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 outlook. It gives a positive outlook uh, to, uh, to the city of Lawrence. Um, and, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought, hang on. Uh, yeah, the, the face of immigration, of course, has changed, right? Uh, it was European, Irish and European for a long time. Uh, and then uh, immigration started uh, getting curtailed uh, in the 1920s. In 1924, uh, President Coolidge signed a bill that came out of Congress <coughs> placing limits on immigration into our country. Um, so, um, 
and then it started up again uh, after World War II uh, in the 1950s with the Latin American uh, immigration, uh, beginning with the Cubans in the 1950s trying to escape the uh, revolution in Cuba when Fidel Castro was uh, uh, overtaking Fulgencio Batista, uh, his government. So, so the, the the face of immigration has changed in Lawrence from you know European in the past to mostly Latin American uh, today. Today being the 1950s to the present. Uh, but again, it it it's always been out there though, right? Okay, and I find that very inspiring for today with all this uh, you know with a lot of immigrants out there today. And you know, wanting to uh, to uh, be uh, part of another community and uh, and contribute, uh, you know, leaving their homeland and coming to a new community, wanting to contribute, wanting to improve themselves, improves. Uh, I'm sorry, improve the lives for their family. Uh, so, uh, and I find that yeah, wow, you know, and that's still the case today. And and. Uh, for example, with the uh, Hispanic population uh, in Lawrence now, you see a lot of them are businessmen and businesswomen. You know, they've um, they've invested uh, some of them own property, and um, and they they run these businesses now in Lawrence. You know, again the same way, let's say some of the Irish and the European immigrants were able to do once they got settled in and and established. And you know that's still happening today, but now with uh, a different part of uh, the population, uh, Latin American versus the European uh, from from years ago. So that's what I find uh, very inspiring, if I understood your question correctly, uh, about Lawrence's past and looking at Lawrence uh, today. Um, and Susan, this was in response to uh, Ernie's question about female and males. Um, okay. She said, FYI, my Polish and Lithuanian relatives arrived in Salem to work, to work the mills. The older sibling arrived, sent funds for streamer passage for the next sibling. The two oldest happened to be brothers who sent funds for sisters to arrive one by one. Then for the youngest sibling, a brother, to come to Boston and from there to Salem. So my family experience was not men versus women, but siblings in order of birth. Okay. Um, All right. Then, yep. Thank you. And finally, um, Eileen Hayes says, uh, "Thank you. It was it was a fabulous presentation. Good questions from participants. So sad that early buildings were torn down. I recall St. Rita's School, Immaculate mm. Conception, Assumption, St. Peter, and St. Paul, St. Lawrence O'Toole Churches. Not sure if Holy Trinity is still there." Uh, yes. Yeah, and and that was all it. Okay. All right. Good. Um, okay, well, you know, if, if any of you in my audience uh, want to know more about Lawrence and its history, I'm hoping uh, next summer uh, at Lawrence Heritage State Park, uh, we'll uh, be able to welcome visitors again, and, uh, and I'll be able to resume my normal tours. Uh, I was there this summer working, just wasn't able to give tours, but I've been there every summer since 2005. And, you know, I love giving my walking tours in the summer, my uh, guided walking tours in the historic district, my uh, narrated boat tours of the Merrimack River, the guided museum tours in the visitor center. So I hope anybody out there who, again, you know, would like to uh, dig into this even more, uh, that next summer, hopefully, if we're able to welcome visitors again at Lawrence Heritage State Park, that, uh, again, those of you who are interested are able to, uh, uh, take some of my tours and you know we'll we'll talk about this and other related things as well so perfect uh, so that concludes our um our lecture for today thank you everyone for joining us yes, thank uh, this, you. this lecture uh was recorded so um it'll probably live on our web page pretty soon in the next week um and thank you so much for joining us it was awesome rich yes thank you Annalise, and thank right. you everybody for participating yes bye-bye Bye-bye.